John, in looking back on your remarkable career in science and in theology and in pioneering the relationship between science and theology, and also witnessing the uh, increasing uh, aggressiveness of, uh, of uh, atheistic views of the world from scientists mainly, um, what do you think right now are the best arguments for the existence of God? Well, there are two kinds of arguments. One, one is, is, is called um, natural theology, which is looking at the, the world. We see a world that is immensely fertile in its character. The ball of energy is now the home of saints and scientists after 13.7 billion years of unfolding development. We see a world that is marvelously ordered in, in, its, in its, its basic fundamental structure. We see a world also whose, the details of whose laws of nature are finely tuned to permit the possibility of carbon-based life. It's only a very special universe, a universe in a trillion, you might say, that is capable of producing carbon and therefore producing carbon-based life. Now, these things are things that science discovers but doesn't explain. And they seem to me to be too significant to be simply happy accidents. And I would like to make them intelligible. And belief in a, a creator uh, whose mind is behind the order of the world and purpose behind its fruitfulness does make them intelligible. That would be one argument for the existence of God. Not a knockdown argument. I don't say that my friends that don't see it that way are stupid, that sort of thing. But that is, to me, more intellectually satisfying than treating these things as uh, just brute facts. But then the, that leaves many other things un, unanswered about God. I mean, does God care for individual people? You know, gives you a picture of God as the cosmic architect, but that's about as far as it takes you. Now, to learn more about God, we have to depend upon acts of divine self-disclosure, which theology calls revelation. Um, we can't put God to the test. God is not to be manipulated in that sort of way. To try and do that is the mistake of magic. And uh, so we have to ask, are have we reason to think that God has acted in particular people or particular circumstances to make the divine nature known more clearly than we see it? And, and that's, that's, that's the role in faith traditions of the great founder figures of the faith and, and the accumulated experience of the, the faith. And in, in, in the Christian case, of course, we believe that God acted particularly through the ancient, his ancient people of Israel and through the life, death, and re re resurrection of Jesus Christ. That you have to look at. You have to assess it carefully. You just don't take it... You're not reading something that's dictated to you. Take it or leave it. You have to say, you know, do we believe these things really happened? Do we believe they really had significance? That's a, 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 absolutely important. That's course, very often called systematic theology. That's a very important part of trying to learn something about the nature of God and of God's existence. So let's look at both of those a little right. carefully. On the first argument in natural theology, many philosophers, even philosophers of religion who are believers, would reject all of that and say in, in today's world that natural th theology doesn't work. And one of the reasons it doesn't work is, is there are other explanations, though popular one today is the multiple universes, so that um, it, whereas the fine-tuning of our universe looks like it has some design elements, in fact, if you have virtually an infinite number of, of uh, multiple universes generated through physical processes and so-called eternal uh, inflation bubbling off many different universes over time, that some of those will have all different characteristics, and maybe it's carbon-based life, maybe some other base life. Uh, and, and so that's not unusual that we're looking in this one because if we weren't, uh, uh, if we were, if we were in a universe in which we couldn't exist, we wouldn't exist and wouldn't ask the question. So th th that's used to completely dismiss natural theology. I don't think it succeeds in doing that because I think it has assumptions that are very open to question. First of all, it is not a scientific hypothesis, established scientific hypothesis that there is any other universe than the one that we, we can actually, actually observe. And even if there were an infinite array of those universes, it doesn't follow that any desirable property, like being able to produce carbon-based life, will be present even in an infinite array. There are an infinite number of even, even integers, but none of them has the property of oddness. <laughs> and, and so there's a, there's a, I'm not convinced by, the, by those arguments. I think they, I think they don't work in, 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 with any, not with persuasive force. Also, the, the multiverse argument, simply, I think, serves one explanatory purpose. It explains, or it explains away, the particular fine-tuned character of our universe. But even the existence of a creator 
does much more explanatory work than that. Not only explains the order of the world and its fruitfulness, it also explains, in my view, the origin of our ethical knowledge as intimations of God's good and perfect will. It explains our aesthetic experiences as a sharing of the Creator's joy in creation. Of course, it also explains the, I think, well-documented, if perplexingly varied, human account of encounter with spiritual reality. So there's a sort of cumulative case for theism, which I don't think is reflected on the multiverse side of things.